Welcome to week eight, class. This is the final week of this course, and what a whirlwind of experience it has been. Throughout our studies, you as students have developed a significant amount of introductory knowledge relative to health information management that will be added to in future courses. In your final week, we will explore coding a bit more in depth by reviewing nomenclature and medical coding classification systems. Near the end of this lecture, we'll review insurance claim processing and the general topic of fraud and abuse. At the conclusion of this lecture, we will briefly review weeks one through eight so that you are prepared for your final exam. With all of this in mind, let's hop right into your final week. When we take on the role of patient while visiting our physicians, the documentation entered about you specifically conforms to medical nomenclature. Medical nomenclature is a clinical vocabulary library. For example, if I am schizophrenic, the nomenclature utilized can be pulled from schizophrenia. Coding or classification systems will organize these nomenclatures in a logical manner. These codes are used to report services rendered with third-party payers as well as external agencies. Let's review the various types of nomenclatures used today. Standardized Nomenclature of Disease, or SND, was developed in the late 1800s and introduced the concept of multi-axial coding. So we code anatomy and the etiology or cause of a specific disease. This is, of course, also a classification system. The Standardized Nomenclature of Diseases and Operations, or SNDO, was developed in 1936 and was largely based off of the SND classification. The only difference is that there's an additional axis added, which is operations. The Systematic Nomenclature of Pathology was created in 1965 by the College of American Pathologists. This used a four-axis system with terms, codes, most commonly used by pathologists. Systematized Nomenclature of Medicine, or SNOMED, was created in the 70s and it provides the ability to codify all activities within a patient's chart. This would include things like procedures, diagnoses, signs and symptoms, and much, much more. Current Medical Information and Terminology, or CMIT, was developed in 81 and it's used for naming and describing of conditions related to areas of medicine. Lastly, the Unified Medical Language System, or UMLS is a set of software developed by the National Library of Medicine that unites health and biomed vocabulary and standards. A more in-depth version of all of these can be found on page 319 of your course text. This and the next slide lists all medical classification and coding systems in existence. A more descriptive listing can be found on page 320 of your course text. But Let's take a moment to review Manual of the International Statistical Classification of Diseases, Injuries, and Cause of Death, or more commonly known as ICD-X. This classification system is widely used in all of healthcare. ICD-10-CM and PCS is the most recently leveraged one in the United States, and we reviewed it briefly in, in a prior week. I helped a few health systems on the East Coast go live for this in October of 2015. It was a very great undertaking that took a lot of consideration throughout the entire process. The dictionary literally exploded with options regarding the classification of diseases, injuries, and cause of death. For example, with ICD-9, I might receive a code for third degree burn, and with ICD-10, it would be so specific that it would say third degree burn via fireworks mishap. I use humor here, but the overall point is still incredibly valid. As a general reminder to students, you can review these in full on pages 320 through 324 in your course text. Let's move on to third-party payers. We've mentioned this term before, but as a review, a third-party payer is an organization that is specifically charged with the processing of claims for reimbursement covered by a specific health plan. Think TRICARE, Blue Cross, and Blue Shield, for example. Commercial payers include your private insurance health companies, as well as your employer-based group health plans. Employer self-insurance plans are just that, self-insurance. The employer accepts exclusive responsibility for paying employee health care without purchasing health insurance. Not all organizations can pull this off, and it's important to note that very few small operations can even consider it. But for those that can, it is incredible speaking from personal experience. Government-sponsored programs are your Medicare, Medicaid programs. TRICARE also fits into this entirely. Care is covered by the government based off of predetermined requirements. 
Managed care models promote the management of care and healthy lifestyles to reduce overall costs. Providers in this grouping accept a predetermined amount per service rendered regardless of the situation. Workers' compensation is a benefit provided to employees that are injured while on the job. These are regulated by the state and can vary, but qualified individuals and their independents qualify if something were to occur while they were working. Now let's review the various prospective payment systems in existence. Really fast, a prospective payment system is a pre-established reimbursement rate system for healthcare services. Diagnosis Related Groups, or DRGs, were implemented in 1983 through legislation called the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act. DRGs use diagnosis groupers to reimburse hospitals at a predetermined rate for Medicare inpatient services. Resource utilization groups were implemented in 1998 and reimbursement services are according to a per diem based off of a prospective rate for a case mix. Per diem repayment is really a thing of the past these days with the introduction of meaningful use in MACRA. Home health resource groups were implemented in the 2000s via the Omnibus Consolidated and Emergency Supplemental Appropriations Act. Medicare home health services are reimbursed according to prospectively determined rates and require that all organizations must be recertified every 60 days. Ambulatory payment classifications came to us in 2001 and prospective payment systems calling for ambulatory payment classifications. Payment rates are established for each APC and some hospitals are paid for more than one APC per encounter, obviously at a discounted rate. Inpatient rehabilitation facility prospective payment systems were implemented in 2002. And this really groups patients based off of clinical characteristics and the, the needed resources for the, the, the treatment of care. The facility must show that they treat the appropriate grouping of patients with specific conditions to receive reimbursements. Long-term care diagnosis related groups were brought to us via the Balanced Budget Refinement Act of 1999. This mandate of prospective payment system uses information from long-term care facilities to logically classify patients into dis distinct long-term care groupings. Lastly, let's review in-stage renal disease composite payment rate systems. The Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act established this payment model. The ESRD doesn't really vary and it includes the cost of drugs, labs, and other items provided to Medicare beneficiaries using dialysis services. A case mix is the types and categorization of patients in a healthcare organization's patient population. A case mix index will indicate the average size of a specific organization's diagnosis related group. Having a high CMI will mean that this care facility delivers services at a high rate with the opposite being true as well. Let's discuss the severity of illness quotient in this equation. This is the physiologic complexity that comprises the extent and interaction of a patient's disease as presented to the medical staff. So one can imagine that payment models can and are dramatically impacted by this consideration. Critical pathways are guidelines that facilitate the management of clinical care with quality directly in your mind. All pathways weigh time constraints as well as overall resources that are required for that specific care. Let's quickly cover how insurance claims are processed. A charge master exists at all facilities and it will serve as a catalog of all services available as well as supplies needed to facilitate care. The encounter form will list all procedures, supplies, and services that a patient receives specifically during their treatment event. Obviously, because this serves as an administrative and financially supportive document, it's reviewed in a regular manner so that claim generation is accurate and timely. The CMS 1450, as an example on page 335 shows, is a standard institutional claim form submitted by care facilities to payers so that reimbursement can be obtained. There are classification codes for service categories that assist in driving how these are processed. An electronic data interchange is the transfer of data from one computer or database to another via an agreed upon format. In the US, the format must be HIPAA compliant. These transitions allow for claims data, among others, to be transmitted near real time. For our last topic this week, it's one that gets quite a bit of coverage and justifiably so. Fraud and abuse in the insurance and reimbursement industry is incredibly commonplace, so we must always remain vigilant to ensure that integrity exists for a variety of reasons. Controlling costs of care is prime among them. We have 
certain safeguards in place to limit this, and first among them is medical necessity. Medical necessity requires documentation for treatment to be very detailed and complete listing a variety of information, diagnoses, treatment plans, medical conditions, and that specific standards of care are met. CMS has an overarching strategy to combat this that primarily depends on prevention, early detection, coordination, and enforcement. Medicare fraudulent practices are regulated by several different entities and legislation. The first one that we'll review is the Civil Monetary Penalties Act, which will actually pose a penalty of up to 10 grand plus any other penalties for a single violation. The Department of Health and Human Services, specifically the Office of the Inspector General, designated a series of provider-specific guidelines which address areas of risk and provides recommendations around how to remain compliant. The National Correct Coding Initiative was developed by CMS to help promote the correct coding methodologies. You can think of it as an initiative to promote best practices in the coding industry as a whole. Never events are literally exactly as they seem. These are preventable and easily identifiable, and thus they should never occur. The consequences are very severe in nature, and they underscore a real problem with safety and organizational credibility. This concludes our introductory exploration into healthcare information management as an industry. Next up on your to-do list is the final exam. To help you recap this eight-week experience, let's review the content that we've covered in each week. During your introductory week, we explored the history of medicine and the delivery of healthcare in the United States. We then covered the differing themes of accrediting and regulatory agencies. In week two, we explored the various types of careers found within health information management. We then reviewed the various HIM professional associations that professionals affiliate themselves with. We then closed the week with a review of the various types of managed care models and what long-term care looks like in the US. In week three, we explored the patient record and responsibilities of providers and patients. In week four, we looked at patient records in more detail and covered specific forms like advanced directives. In week five, we looked at the various numbering and filing systems, as well as record storage and general circulation processes. In week six, we reviewed indexes, registers, and overall healthcare data collection processes. In week seven, we reviewed the electronic health record landscape in greater detail and looked at additional policies and regulatory topics. And lastly, in this week, we explored coding a bit more in depth by reviewing nomenclature and medical coding classification systems, as well as the overall topic of fraud and abuse. As your guest lecturer, I thank you for your attention these past eight weeks and wish you all the best in your future studies and professional endeavors. The Knowledge Base Foundation that we've developed throughout this course will aid you incredibly well as you progress forward.